Okay guys, we're, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. My name is Joe Patton. I work for Duncan Lewis. Um, Duncan Lewis is the manufacturer sales rep agency who sells Johnson Outdoors, Humminbird, Minn Kota, Cannon, Lake Master um, throughout about a third of the country. Yeah, roughly. The whole south um, including Rogers Sporting Goods here. Rogers is my account. I sell them this product. I sell them some other products as well. Uh, I have Troy Franson here with me, also with Duncan Lewis. My capacity as a rep for Duncan Lewis, in addition to selling Johnson Outdoors, there are some other lines I sell as well. Um, I'm what I call dangerously knowledgeable about Johnson's product, meaning uh, I know well above average what that product is. Troy does nothing for the agency but sell Johnson Outdoors. So Troy is truly a subject matter expert. Uh, he'll deny that sometimes, but he's the guy who I call when I don't know the answer. So. A lot of times on these presentations, I bring Troy along because he is very good at explaining this product. And when you start asking questions that I don't know the answer to, Troy's who I need help. Okay. Before I hand off to Troy and I start having him go through some things, um, I kind of want to open a dialogue here and and talk about why we do what we do. Okay. So we're all here to look at Humminbird Minn Kota. Um, is anybody here search and rescue and that's why you came here today? Show of hands. No search and rescue people. One, maybe? Okay. So we're all here we're all here because we like to fish. Is that right? Show of hands. Who's here because they want to fish? Okay, every one of you. Okay. Now, show of hands. Who makes money fishing? <laughs> Roger Sporting Goods. <laughs> well, <laughs> well they sell it. So none of you guys make money fishing. Okay. So why do we fish? Why don't we do that? Because it's not a matter of life and death, it's much more important. It's pleasure, okay. right? It's fun. It's, it's fun. It's a passion that we have, right? We, we, either, we either go out because it's fun to catch big bass, or we go out because we love a mess of fresh crappie to eat, right? We want to hook into a big catfish. But, but none of us, the point that I'm making is, none of us have to, have to fish for subsistence today. Right, we've we've got other ways to feed ourselves, um, and if you have if you've bought a boat and you're rigging it with electronics and you've made that time and money investment into that vehicle for fishing, um, quite frankly, if you were doing that for sub for subsistence to actually catch fish to eat and live off of that food, it's fairly inefficient, right? Like it's it's probably much much more efficient time and dollar wise to go to the store, buy your food, go home and eat it. Right? So it's important for me when I look at this and I talk about it, we fish because it's something that is fun. It's something that we're passionate about, right? Um, it's something that quite frankly, like our passions are what we live for, right? Like our professions are how we live. It's, it's how we get our money to be able to afford our lifestyle, but, but our passions are really what we live for, okay? And so for me as a sales rep, what I do for a living, my job is to sell products to retailers. My job is to help them grow their business. Uh, my job is to work for factories who are essentially selling products that almost universally are used for people's passions, right? And this is, this is one of the reasons why I love what I do and, and what our agency does. Um, we are here to support your passions, okay? Humminbird Minn Kota, Canon, Johnson Outdoors. What we have that is more unique to our products is we build a fishing system. So why do we put fish finders and trolling motors on a boat? Anybody? To make it easier. To make it easier. Okay. Do so we may have some retirees here. So so some of you, do you get to fish however much you want as often as you want? Show of hands who gets to do that. <laughs> All right. So Good for you. So we have so about half the people here can do that. The other half of us right? We're limited. We have other time obligations. Okay. So Humminbird and Minn Kota has a system, right? A one boat network. And what you have to look at, a lot of people want to ask us about that spot lock trolling motor, or they want to ask us about that mega live, or they want to ask us about that side imaging. And, and what I want you to keep an open mind to and really look at is it is not just one of those components. It is a system of components that work in conjunctions 
to help you be more efficient on the water, to help you eliminate unproductive water, to find the water that is productive, that's holding fish that can bite, okay? Um, it's not one component, and, and our strength as a, as a company selling fish finders, selling trolling motors, is this one boat network where the sum of the parts is greater than any one of them, right? Um, being able to use all of this in conjunction, being able to have fish finders that talk to your trolling motor, being able to have um, fish finders that can talk to your shallow water anchors, we make those as well. Being able to direct your mega live and have it either work with your trolling motor or um, being able to use it with target lock to where it works either you know in conjunction or independently of that trolling motor. Okay, we we build a one boat network that truly is a fishing system. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Troy here in a minute. What Troy's specifically going to talk about today, he's going to talk about some of our new motors this year, uh, their features, why they're beneficial. He's going to get into um, Mega Life on this presentation. He's going to talk a bit about 360. That's 360 is a very unique Humminbird product. Um, and then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up. Okay. Um, if you guys want to see how we do something on here, we can do that. If you want to get into some of the more traditional sonar technologies, down side image, um, 2D sonar, we can talk about that. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, Troy Franzen. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Can everybody hear me all right? Good, thank you. So, yeah, my name is Troy Franson. Um, I work for Duncan Lewis, as Joe kind of mentioned. I've done this for about 18 years, um, and uh, this is this is what I do in day out, day in day out. I work with a lot of boat builders and uh, and that, and then I do a lot of presentations. So, um, yeah, the first part of this, we're going to talk a little bit about. It, it's going to be kind of a formal PowerPoint presentation. It's only going to be about 20 minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the new motors, just a brief overview on them. Um, talk a little bit about some of the new sonar technology and, and again a pretty brief overview just kind of hit the highlights The second part of this I hope is very interactive if you're here you want to lo you want to learn something um, There's a question you've got or something. Please raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer it I've got the unit over here to the side which is plugged into the TV um, So I can bring it up on the TV so everybody can see if there's a setting you want to change or Like one of the questions I get asked a lot is you know I've got side imaging on my boat, but I'm not sure how it works or how do I how do I get that clear picture or something like that? So by all means, ask questions, um, and I'll stay here as long as we need to. So as long as I can get back to Springfield, Missouri by by uh, six o'clock tonight, I'm fine. So with that said, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the new motors and and um, um, so one thing that we've introduced for 2024 um, is a new brushless family of trolling motors. So we've made I say we as in Minn Kota has made. Um, permanent magnet trolling motors for about 80 years. Um, we are the world's leader, man, leading manufacturer in trolling motors. Um, and so something new for us this year is we've switched and we've came out with a brushless trolling motor. You'll hear me say Quest. If I say Quest, that just means brushless in, in our language, right, in the Minn Kota language. And if you hear me say permanent magnet, permanent magnet is the style of trolling motor, actual motor that we've made for 80 years. So with that said, in our freshwater, and I'm going to concentrate mainly on the on the left-hand side. I hope everybody, can everybody see the presentation okay? Good. So on the left-hand side in our electric steer <clears throat> trolling motors, multi-species, we've got Ulterra. Ulterra trolling motor is the one that auto stow and deploys and has the auto trim feature. Um, it's, it's a great motor used in a lot of multi-species boats. Um, great for guys who are a little older and don't want to have to get up on the bow of their boat and reach over to pull that trolling motor back into the boat every time. You can hit one button on your remote motor automatically trims up and comes in the stowed position. So we're going to make it in the permanent magnet version, that, again, that we've made for years. We have updated those motors and made some, some improvements to them. And then we've got the new Quest version on the right-hand side as well. So both named Altera, but you've got Altera and then you've got Altera Quest. Same thing for Tarova. Tarova is very similar to Altera other than Tarova is the manual stow and deploy. So it's the motor that, again, is electric steer, but you reach up, grab it, you pull it in, and, uh, and auto and self stow and deploy it and we're going to make it in the Tarova Quest. And then at the bottom there is the power drive. Um, no changes to power drive for next year. Um, it goes forward. Salt water we won't worry about. I, here in, in Kansas City there's not a lot of salt water close to us. So on the, on the uh, cable steer trolling motors 
Um, we've got Ultrex. Ultrex we came out with in 2018, I believe. It was the first hybrid, what we called hybrid steer. So it was driven with your foot like a traditional cable steer motor, but it had a power steering built into it. And the most important feature is Ultrex has spot lock, right? You can pull out on the lake wherever you want to go on top of a brush pile or a ledge or whatever, and you can hit one button. The GPS receiver and the trolling motor gets that coordinate, and then the trolling motor holds you in there in place, and you can fish and do whatever you want to do. So we've made Ultrex since 2018, and then new for this year is Ultrex Quest. It is just the brushless version of it. I'll talk about some of the advantages of brushless and some of the, the additions that we've made to both series of motors. Maxim and Fortrex stay the same, and so does Edge at the bottom. So the first question is, what is Quest? Um, so Quest is a brushless system, and there are advantages to any brushless motor. Like if you've got a hand drill or electric drill at home, now, if you go into Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever, about every drill has, has went to brushless technology. There are advantages to it. Um, one of them is that it is a more efficient system. So if you took the same boat with the same batteries, everything identical, and you put a permanent magnet motor, and it wouldn't matter if it's a Minn Kota or any of the other competition, or and you put a brushless motor on the same boat, and you ran them both the same amount of time, the brushless system is more efficient, and it will just run longer. Um, so that's one advantage. Approximately. Oh yeah, about 20%, 20 to 30%, depending on the motors, but they're about 20% more efficient, everything else being equal. Um, number two um, is they have a, um, they are more efficient with the energy that they get. So you get more torque out of it. Um, and you'll notice that a lot with, with uh, Quest over our permanent magnet, especially in the Ultrex. Um, I ran permanent magnet Ultrex since about 2016. When I switched to Quest, um, I noticed on my, my actual speed control on my boat that when I was fishing with the permanent magnet, I would fish around three and a half or four. That was this kind of the speed setting on my, my motor was around three and a half or four. When I went to, to Quest, I went back to like two and a half to three on my power setting and got the same miles per hour. So the motor creates more torque. It's kind of like a gas in a diesel engine, right? A diesel engine has more, more torque, Quest kind of does the same thing. It has more torque built into it, so not only is it a more efficient system, but it actually produces more power at the same time. Um, oh, and another thing, and I've got a screen capture here in a second um, that I'll talk about a little bit as well, but we also with Quest have the ability to run what we call a battery monitoring system. So there is a screen on the units, on the either Solux or Apex or Helix units. Again, it has to be a Hummingbird unit. But uh, you can go to it and you can actually monitor your batteries in real time. So it'll tell you what percent in 1% increments is left in your batteries. It'll tell you what your um, estimated runtime is that's left. So, you know, if we're out on the lake and it says we're at 47% battery life, it says you've got two and a half hours of runtime left. And then it will tell you what time you are going to run out of battery. At, at 6.08 p.m., your batteries are going to be dead, right? And that constantly adjusts. As you use the trolling motor, if you use it more hard and you're going faster, that time's going to decrease. And if you back off of it and you start, you know, using the motor a little easier, that time will increase. And I've got a screen capture here in a couple of slides I'll show you. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything too there. But that's, yeah, that's it in a, in a nutshell. So a couple other key benefits of, of Quest and of brushless technology. Um, you do also get motor longevity. So a brushless motor by design doesn't have brushes that rub against an, um, a magnets or anything else. So there are less moving parts, there's less contact, just longer, longer run life. I talked about it being more efficient. I talked a little bit about the power increase. It is also quieter, kind of for that same reason, there's less moving parts in the motor. So brushless motors tend to be quieter than a permanent magnet motor when the actual motor's running in the water. Um, and the rest of that, I think, I will talk about a little later in the presentation. So one of the changes that we've made, and this is going to go across the board, so for permanent magnet or for Quest series of motors, is we have used what we call Universal Sonar 2, US2, for about 15 years in our trolling motors. That was the built-in transducer in the head of the motor. It was kind of a round puck, and it's what gave you, you can kind of see shadowed out in the background there, that 2D sonar view, right? Gives you your digital depth gives you your 2D sonar. Um, we've upgraded that to what we call dual spectrum chirp. Um, and all that really means is that that universal sonar transducer has been upgraded to a chirp, trans chirp transducer. 
um, and there's a little different adapter cable that you need, and it will come in the box with the unit to hook it up to your Hummingbird unit. Yes, sir? Is it there transducers in the, um, oh, the line before that you're talking about? I'm Built in? The, the type of troll motor. Mm -hmm. In all the patrol motors? Good question. So if you couldn't hear, his question was, are there transducers built into all the trolling motors going forward? And yes, yes, there are. And in Ultrex, let's just talk about Ultrex. In permanent magnet, you will have dual spectrum chirp, that 2D sonar here, or you can get it with mega down imaging built in. With Quest, you'll get it with dual spectrum chirp, or with mega side imaging built in. And with the mega side imaging, you will also get mega down imaging included. So one of the things about Hummingbird is, and our sonar, and I'm, I'm kind of skipping around, but if you think about our sonar kind of as a good, better, best, as far as that goes, 2D sonar, standard, traditional 2D sonar would be good. Down imaging would be better. Side imaging would be best. <clears throat> if you buy a motor with side imaging built in, you will automatically get down imaging and you will automatically get DSC dual spectrum chirp built in. Um, so yes, every Ultrex will still have it in. If it's a, a Maxim or a Fortrex motor, it will still be available with with DSC with universal sonar built in. But what if it's not Ultrex? You have a Terranova. Terova. So Terova and Ultera, the electric steer motors, follow the same pattern. So they'll both permanent magnet or permanent magnet will be available with dual spectrum chirp and mega down imaging built in. Quest brushless motors will be available with dual spectrum chirp and mega side imaging built in, okay. either way. And the shaft links stay the same um, as far as if you've got a 45 inch shaft or a 52 or a 60, whatever link shaft link, <coughs> that will all stay the same. Um, and I should mention while I'm kind of talking about brushless, the brushless motor is 24 or 36 volt and it automatically recognizes it. So any brushless Quest motor, if you're running a 24 volt system, when you plug it in, it will automatically recognize there's 24 volts, and it's 90 pounds of thrust at 24 volt. If it's a 36 volt system, three batteries, it's 115 pounds of thrust. The torque is really where you get it. It's about 30% more torque that you feel in that motor versus the permanent magnet. Great question. Thank you. So, go ahead. Yes, sir. Our, yeah, in the Quest, is the motherboard better than what it was in the Altrex? Because I've had I've had mine in probably two, we, two or three times for the motherboard going out. Yeah, and I've taken it to, to uh, Marine Repair in Springfield. Yeah. So when did you buy your Ultrex? Was it so it came out in eighteen? Did you buy one of the, in the first year, out. eighteen months? Is it not eighteen? Uh, it was actually it was, it was fall of sixteen. It was probably okay. It was probably twenty. Okay. Twenty or twenty one. So. So his question was, have you made any changes to the motherboard? And it, it, the motherboard itself kind of wasn't the problem. What the problem is, it, it originally wasn't potted and sealed. So that motherboard wasn't sealed, um, basically in a potting material to keep water and, and debris and intrusion from getting in there. And it has been since then. So yes, Quest and, and Ultrix permanent magnet going forward. Those are all potted and sealed um, boards. Now, not to say that we still don't have an issue. You'll have a, a, an issue with a board or a, a cable or something. I mean, those kind of things do pop up. Yeah. But we have made inline changes to the motors as we've noticed, hey, you know, there's, there is a problem. We had another problem with a steering board at one time um, where the foot pedal steering would, would, wouldn't work. And we realized, hey, there was a problem with the board. We made the change in line. Of course, we don't tell people. We just we make the change, we fix the problem, and we go forward. And any issues that we have, all the motors, Quest motors, have a three-year warranty. So everything's covered under a three-year warranty. If you have any issues, obviously an ASC, a service center, can fix it for you. Um, so, yes, we have made changes there. Okay. Um, all right. So I kind of talked about the dual spectrum chirp, and this is, a, this is an important one. So one of the challenges as a, as a rep that Joe and, and myself dealt with um, previous was a, a consumer guy would come in and you buy a new Ultra X trolling motor and you buy a new Hummingbird unit, and then you had to buy a, an adapter cable or two to make everything plug in together and make everything work and, and to make that one boat network. So going forward, it doesn't matter if it's permanent magnet or if it is Quest, all the adapter cables that you need to hook it up to the first Hummingbird unit will be included in the box with the trolling motor. Um, and every motor, again, doesn't matter if it's permanent magnet or Quest, 
will be what we call one boat network ready. So before this, we called it iPilot Link. Link was the, the term that we used that said you could link your trolling motor to your fish finder and you could mark a waypoint with your fish finder and you could tell your trolling motor, go over and take me to that waypoint and hold me there, right? You could, they would interact and they would work together. So every motor going forward is one boat network ready. It will hook to a hummingbird unit and all the cables that you need will be in the box to hook it to that first hummingbird unit. Now, if you've got multiple units, if you're going to run a, a full network of two or three units at your bow and at your console or whatever, you might need some additional cables and, and some stuff to make that happen. But everything that you need will be in the box, and there's a kind of a listing here of it. Doesn't really, it's not really important, but just know that you'll have everything you need, sonar and network-wise, to connect it to your Hummingbird unit. So this is a screen capture of that um, battery monitoring system that I, was, I kind of touched on earlier. Um, you can see on the right, this is a, a screen capture from an Apex unit. The, that's the unit that I have over here to the side of the TV. Um, but you can see up here at the top, right now our battery percentage is at 100%. We're at 38.2 volts. We're running a 36-volt system on this one. Um, there's some, some data right here that you will input um, into it. So to, that will obviously change if you're running lithium batteries versus AGM versus lead acid. So the type of battery that you have and the size capacity the amp hour rating of that battery, you'll input that information in. That tells the unit kind of a base, hey, here's where we're going to start at. And then as you start using the motor throughout the day, that battery percentage uh, level will decrease. Your voltage might decrease a little bit. Um, but down here at the bottom, it says, we, hey, if we're running this motor at 100% right now, we've got three hours and 30 minutes of runtime left, and we're going to run out of juice at 8.07 p.m. So, um, and again, as you use it throughout the day, that, that data will change and adjust accordingly. Um, also up here at the top, and it might be hard to see, but right here on the side, you'll see a little button that says eco mode. And just like our cell phones do now, you know, if you've got your cell phone out and you're talking on it and you're scrolling Facebook, when your phone gets down to about 20% battery life, it turns on the little eco mode and basically it shuts down all the apps in the background and it tries to conserve that battery to get you through the rest of the day. The units have the same ability to do that with a Quest motor. So when the battery percentage gets down to 20%, by default, the unit will automatically turn on eco mode, and it's going to try to conserve that battery life and get you as long a run time as you can out of it. If you're only going to fish, let's say, for 20 or 30 minutes, you're about done, you can turn that eco mode on or off manually, or you can turn it on manually if you want. If you want to run the motor in eco mode, you can. If you want to run it in, in full power mode, you just toggle that switch on and off right there. So. Um, that's built into all the, all the Quest motors. Another simplification. Um, before, we've had four remotes. So um, in, in 2023 and before, we had our co-pilot, we had our micro remote, and then we had separate remotes for iPilot and iPilot Link systems. Going forward, there will only be two remotes. You'll have the, the micro remote, which has been super popular. It will come with all Ultrex trolling motors. They're going to come with a little micro remote. You can hang it around your neck on the lanyard. Um, important things there is it's got spot lock. And that's what you know everybody wants. And that's what we all use. We love spot lock. So you can hit the spot lock button on it. Um, Ultrex, or excuse me, Ultera and Tarova electric steer motors will come with what we call the wireless remote. That's the remote there on the right. Um, the kind of full-size remote with the screen tells you what's going on, tells you what direction the motor's pointed. And it also has four smart keys on it. So kind of circled in red there along the bottom. And one side key on the uh, right-hand side are smart keys, programmable buttons that you can tell it what you want it to do. If you want to mark a waypoint, you can program that remote that every time you hit that button, it's going to mark a waypoint for you. Um, you can run your shallow water anchors off of it. If you're running an Altera trolling motor, you can stow and deploy it from those, those smart keys. Um, so can do a lot with them. Uses two AA batteries. That's another one. Um, we, we, we get the, uh, the question a lot, does the remote float? And the remote does not float. It will sink. So we used to make a remote that did float. Um, the problem with a, a, a remote that floats is you have to use a little light battery, right? Because weight would make stuff sink. So we use those little round, like watch batteries, that, you know, the bigger, the flat, whatever they're called. Button cell. Button, Button cell. cell. Thank you, Joe. Um, the problem with that is at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning when you get to the boat ramp and you realize that your remote's dead because your batteries are dead, you can't go to Walmart and buy those batteries or it's, it's much more difficult. Double A batteries, 
everybody's got a dozen of them hanging around the house, right? So if your battery and your remote goes dead, you can swap out the AA batteries, no problem. Um, the downside to it is because we add big AA batteries, the remotes sink. So um, another simplification. So we've, we've done a lot this year to try to make things easier on the consumer. Um, again, before over here on the right hand or left hand side, we had uh, five different apps for, for Johnson Outdoors, for trolling motors, for hummingbird fish finders, for our talon and, and raptor shallow water anchors. All that was done with five different apps. Going forward, we have what we call the One Boat Network app. Um, everything that we did before, we can now do from that app, and we can do some additional stuff. So a couple really nice things about it. Um, I've got it on my phone, and I, I won't show you here, but I, I will be happy to after, after we kind of disperse if you want to come up and look at it. But number one, when I Bluetooth my phone to my Hummingbird unit, it's going to put on the app everything that I've got on my network. So all my Hummingbird units, my Minn Kota, Ultrex, Quest, Trolling Motor, all that information is on there. And if there is a software update in the future, you'll get a notification on your app. So when you open the app up, you'll look at it and it'll say, hey, there's a, you'll have a little star by it. and You'll click on it and it'll say, hey, you've got a software update for your Helix 10 Gen 4 unit. Um, and you can download those software updates through the app and you can put them strict directly onto the unit or onto the trolling motor or anything else. The other nice thing about it is at the bottom in bright yellow, there is a request a callback feature. So let's say you're out fishing on a Saturday afternoon, you have an issue with a unit or, or whatever and you can't figure out what it is and it's Saturday, you know, your Rogers is closed or whatever, you can't call somebody to figure out, you can open your app up, you can click on that request a callback button and it'll give you kind of a time frame, but within 15 minutes, you'll get a call from Hummingbird's Technical Service saying, hey, Mr. Jones, what's going on? What's, what's the problem? How can we help you? Not only that, they will have access to all that information. So again, every unit that's on your boat, every, um, everything that you've got in the network, they will have in front of them. So if, you, if you're having an issue and they look at their, their customer service screen and they say, hey, Mr. Jones, you have an updated software on your Helix 10. That's the reason your Mega Live's not working. Let's get your software updated. That'll fix your problem. So a lot of compatibility, um, a lot of nice features in it, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 just much better. Uh, just real quick, a couple couple lot of things. I'm about done with the Minn Kota portion. Um, we did also add that smart key feature to our trolling motor foot pedals. So on the Ultrax and then the Tarova and uh, Alteros. This little button that's circled in red used to be what we called our autopilot button. Now it's that same smart key. So you can program your foot pedal button to do whatever you want. Mark a waypoint, um, change screens. Um, it can do a lot of stuff. So we added that to the foot pedals. Uh, quick release brackets and some new accessories. And now some of the good stuff. So that's it. Any other questions on Minn Kota? And, and by all means, we can. We, I'll ask her answer questions. If you got something afterwards, you can come up to me afterwards, but that's kind of the main code portion. There's less left assist on the altar. How much left assist is there when you're trying to pick that up? So, good question. Another good question. So on Ultrex Quest, or yeah, let's just Ultrex Quest because that's what's got lift assist. The new Quest motor actually has two lift assist cylinders in the mount. So the, one of the disadvantages to Quest, I should have mentioned that earlier, is it is a little heavier. The, the motors, the mount itself is bigger and sturdier, so it's a little heavier mount because we're dealing with that extra torque that the motor's giving out, and the motor itself is a little bit heavier too. So we actually put two gas shocks in the lift assist, and it takes off about 30 to 35% of the lifting force needed. So um, on permanent magnet, there hasn't been a change to the lift assist portion on it because, again, we really didn't, we didn't change the motor. We updated some features on the motor and did some changes there. But the lift assist on it's the same. Ultrex Quest actually has two gas shocks built in to help lift even more. And as more and more guys are adding live sonar to, the, to their trolling motors and 360 to their trolling motors, you're just adding more weight over the end. So those two gas shocks help take that weight off as well. We, so, and we do make, so if you go with the non-Quest, Ultrax, or you have a legacy Ultrax, right, a 23 or earlier model, we do sell a an upgraded lift assist mount. So the, the issue becomes, as Troy mentioned, um, as, as people <clears throat> add accessories to this, right, it can be heavy to pull. The Ultrax by itself isn't bad. You know, you add a 360, it's a little bit more. 
but you got a 360 in our target lock and, and it's a lot of weight. So we do actually sell uh, for the non-quest and for the legacy, quest, or sorry, for the, the non-quest and the legacy old trucks, we do sell an upgraded lift assist bracket if it's either, if you're either struggling or if you've added accessories and you want to take some of that load off. Yes, sir. Answered your question? Perfect. I knew Absolutely. you were going to ask it, so I... <laughs> Any other questions on it? Cost. Cost? <clears throat> so, I, I, uh, I can tell you, ex I don't know retails right off the hand, I can tell you that the Quest version, so if you took the permanent magnet version and the Quest version, the Quest version is about $500 more um, cost um, versus the permanent magnet. Um, that's and that's part of the reason why we're making both is is there are two different price points and and yeah. and that part. So I, I believe that we started about twenty five ninety nine on the non quest and we started about thirty ninety nine on the quest Ultrax. That would be the yeah forty five inch shaft. And the nice yeah. thing about quest is it doesn't matter if it's eighty or or, or twenty four thirty six volt you get either way. So um, all right. So some of the kind of the fun stuff to talk about or uh, not that the Minn Kota portion wasn't but free money. So starting February 1st of this year and going through March 31st, um, Hummingbird is offering a $500 instant savings on Mega Live and any Mega Live uh, version. So we make a target lock version. I'll talk about Mega Live. I've got some screen captures here in, in, a little later in the presentation and what kind of makes it unique um, about our Mega Live. Um, but $500 instant savings. So the live transducer by itself retailed for or retails for $1,500, $1,499.99. Um, you instantly save $500, gets it down to $999.99, $1,000 retail. Um, and that's just for the transducer. And if you want to add target lock or, or uh, any of the other features or kind of accessories down at the bottom, you go up from there. But $500 instant savings on any of those Mega Live um, transducers or accessories. So try to go back real quick. Yep. <coughs> So if I just want to add a mega live transducer to my hummingbird up front, say I have one hummingbird up front, I want to add this to it. Yeah. What else do I need? Nothing. So that's an advantage to live over some of our competitors. There is no black box that you need to hook up everything to. So with our live transducer, there are just two cables. There's a power cable and there's a network cable. Um, it runs, the, the live on our system runs through our network, our Ethernet network, if you've heard us talk about it or heard it before. So it plugs directly into the back of the unit or it can plug into our five port switch, but there's no other accessories, no black box, nothing that goes along with it. Everything is in the, is in the unit. Yes, sir. Now, is it mega live? Does it work with the Solix or any unit? Yep. So, well, so mega live works with any Gen 3 or Gen 4 Helix unit. It will work with any Solix generation unit and any Apex generation unit. So Gen 3 or Gen 4 Helix, any Solix and any Apex unit live will work with. Yep. Now shaft length doesn't have anything to do with it. Shaft length doesn't have anything to do with, with it. You can mount it to the shaft any, you know, on any shaft. Even a 60 plus. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank so that, that part's not a problem um, as far as that goes. Question. Yes, sir. When you buy the. Yes. So in the box, so on the on the transducer itself, the mount is right here along on the side. That mounts to our um, standard, so what we call our, our standard size trolling motor shaft. So our permanent magnet shaft, it will mount directly to. The other advantage to this over some of the competitors is what we call the landscape mode. So when you flip that transducer, that live transducer out horizontal and you get this wide view, that is built into the unit as well. So you don't have to buy a separate accessory in order to get the landscape mode. It's built directly into the mount already. I'll, I'll show you that here in a second, the, the difference in down mode, forward mode, and then landscape when we turn it out flat. Um, so that is also included with the mount and that's as well. And side boat mount there on the left bottom. So this is your, this is your hand control right. steering. So if you're running Tarova or um, Ulterra electric steer motors you can't mount the transducer directly to the shaft because the shaft slides up through that steering cylinder right. or steering housing so you can't mount it to it so we we offer a separate mount that mounts to either your gunnel or in the boat and then sticks out over and then you can hand steer it which a lot of guys like to and we, we yeah, I'll, I'll get into some of the details so we also have target lock which gets around that as well but 
one of the disadvantages when you're in spot lock mode and if you've got the transducer mounted to the shaft is obviously whatever direction the trolling motor is pointed to hold you in spot lock is the direction that your live sonar transducer is pointed. So if you go with a hand steer or some separate mount, we make a, 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 an option called target lock for Ultrex, which actually allows you to steer that live sonar independent of what the trolling motor is doing. And that includes the 360. Too. Um, so you can get a mount with, with live and with 360 with as well. Right. Yep. They're separate products. Yep. Oh, okay. More money, more money, more money. Oh, yeah. We're here for, I told you it was a system. <laughs> yeah. So, in addition to the $500 instant rebate on any live product, Hummingbird is running up, up to a $500 rebate on any Helix um, and Solix product. Uh, not any. Yes. But, so it starts at Helix 5, $40. Once you get to Helix 9 and above, it's a $500 mail-in rebate. So there is a difference there. The live is an instant rebate. You, you pay at the cash register. Um, the um, rebate for Hummingbird for Helix and, and Solux and 360 is a mail-in rebate, and you get a MasterCard gift card back from Hummingbird um, for that one. Again, up to $500 um, on it. So again, February 1st through March 31st, um, all these rebates are, are active. So um, yeah, you can save $1,000 if you bought a live and, and a new Helix 9 or Helix 10 unit. It's a $1,000 savings. Yes, sir. Yeah, any Helix 9, 10, because uh, you get on their website, well, this one is, but this one isn't, and they get the rebate form. They say it is. I mean, yeah, so any Helix 9 product, so it doesn't matter if it's uh, an MDI, uh, CHO without a transducer built in, or if it's a side imaging unit with a transducer, that rebate is is good for any of them. For for our current product. Right? Yeah, it so has to be Gen Four. We're on current Gen product. Four, so if you yeah. happen if you happen to walk into a store where somebody happened to have a, you know, four year old Generation Three Helix, that one's not on the rebate right now. They probably should have cleared that out when we. Look at nines and tens. Yeah. So. Yep. The, and and then the one thing that kind of got snuck in here that that has been really low key that uh, I do want to call out. If you look on the right side here, our our Mega 360 transducer is on there, and that has a $400 mail-in rebate available on it right now. That's what I'm. And I'll I'll talk about it as well here. So. Can you compare to Garmin? Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about the comparison. I'll give you my honest opinion on the on I the two. That. Yep. So talking a little bit about Mega Live and Mega 360. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of start to talk about it a little bit and show some screen captures and, and uh, some of the product and, and how it works. But so here's a picture, a screen capture. This is our, obviously, this is our trolley motor and, and our live transducers plugged in. And this is what we call down mode. So there's kind of three modes that you can run the, the live transducer in. And this, is, this is, goes for Garmin and Lowrance and Hummingbird all the same. Um, but in down mode, so if you look at this little kind of, I know it's probably hard to see back there, but there's a little half moon shaped um, round um, part right here. That's what we call the send anode. So that's where the actual sonar signal is coming out of. And then this long flat bar right behind it is the receive side. So if we point that down, let me, let me back up just a second. Let me talk about what the live... Um, sonar coverage is in the water column. So, so from forward underneath the boat, I'm about 125, 130 degrees, right? So I'm, I'm looking from here out in front of me, kind of at an angle down. Again, imagine I'm sitting on the bow of my boat and then it's scanning down underneath the boat and it's actually coming back underneath the boat behind me. So I've got a lot of coverage front to back, but we're, we're pretty narrow right to left. Right, about 15 degrees or so is the is the angle of that beam. So one of the disadvantages to live, and it doesn't matter if it's hummingbirds or any of the competition, is with live you're kind of limited in how much coverage you got. If you're a guy who's run live, it doesn't matter again if it's ours or, or the competitions. You know, you got to be pretty well pointed at that target, that brush pile of that tree, to be able to see it, and then you got to be able to cast into that fairly narrow beam to be able to see your bait in that in in the the return which you're gonna see here in just a second. So in down mode, we're about 135 degrees, 130 degrees here. We're about 15 to 18 degrees wide um, in this one. And so I'll do this and then we'll click it forward. Here's our bait going down. There's our fish coming up. He's jigging it a little bit there to tease the fish. There's another fish coming into the signal and then it resets. It's, it's just a short, 
Again, here's our bait feet, dropping down. How many feet or meters does that put you away from the target? So in, in this particular video, I don't have the grid pattern. I'll show you a screen capture. I can actually lay out a grid. So this is two foot, four foot, six foot, eight foot, 10. And then the same deal. Here's my transducer. Here's the, the range I'm looking out either side. I can actually make a grid pattern on the screen, which will say show you exactly how far away something is. But um, it, it does give you range and that is either manually adjustable. So you can adjust the range and the depth manually if you want or you can have it in auto mode. So now we're looking in this screen capture at forward. So we've taken that transducer and there's a, there's a click adjustment on the, on the transducer on the shaft and it's in 10 degree increments. So I've clicked it and I've now, I pointed that round send anode forward. So now you'll see kind of my angle of my beams have changed. I'm looking basically almost flat across the surface of the water and then I'm pointed still back down underneath the boat a little ways. So I've just taken that, that signal, that transducer, and I've twisted it forward. So this is in forward mode. Again, here's our live action. The bait is actually right in here. There it goes, and he just caught a fish. It'll replay here. The bait jigging right there. Fish is coming up. Oh. So that's one of the advantages of any live sonar is everything is real time. Everything that you see on the screen is what is happening right now. And it's almost like video game fishing, right? You're, you're not even, in a lot of cases, I'm not even looking at my pole. I'm just watching the screen because I can see, watch the screen. And, and in my opinion, one of the advantages I think that we have over the competition is we have a quicker refresh rate than the competition does. We don't have that little bit of delay that's between what you see on the screen and what you feel on your rod tip. Um, we, we have a little faster refresh rate. So this is it in, in forward mode. And then the last one, this is that landscape mode that I, I kind of talked about. So now we've taken that transducer, if you can see here, and I apologize, I know it's small for a lot of people, but we've taken it now where we were pointing forward and we've laid it out horizontal. So now instead of looking forward to, to back underneath the boat, and being narrow, we've taken that beam and we've laid it out flat. So now top to bottom, we're narrow, but we've got a big wide sweep right to left in front of us. So you'll see the screen's kind of changed. The transducer's now down here. This little black part, that's the water column. And then out here would be the bottom of the lake. And then if I hit play, all those little white dots moving around, those are all fish swimming. And if you look close, you can kind of see their shadows, what we call their sonar shadows, cast out behind them. So those are all fish moving. Oh, I'll play it again. Would, you, would that be more for a shallow water application there by laying that transducer horizontal <clears throat> like that? Yeah, so it, it works better probably in shallow water if you're trying to kind of look up on a bank. Um, I honestly, I don't run landscape a lot, but like a scenario where I think you could is if you were, if crappie were spawning or, or bass were spawning on the bank and you wanted to see and I'll show you here in a few pick, in a few slides like some crappie beds where you can actually see the pothole crappie bed and fish on them. If you could lay that out flat where you could see those fish on those beds and you could see they were there and then you could cast to them and, and try to entice them off that bed, that would be an application where you would want to lay it out landscape mode, see that wide angle out in front of you. Is that where most people run them? I mean, in, in shallow water or is that, does that work everywhere? Yeah, well, it can work everywhere. Shallow water is going to be more effective only because you're, you've got less top to bottom. So if, if I was in 30 foot of water and I was trying to use okay. landscape mode, you're just not covering much of the water column top to bottom because again, you've got the kind of the narrow part of that beam is what you're using. So you would see a lot right to left, but you wouldn't see a lot of the water column because you're, you're shooting in it. So when you get into shallower water, just naturally you're covering, covering a higher percent of the water column because there's not as much water column to cover. So in shallow water, landscape mode would work better just because of that, that, op, that op. So if you had it, say you had it in deeper water in that, what are you looking at just from the top of the water down so far? Or? Yeah, so it, it depends a little bit on the range of how far you're looking because it is like a 15 degree. So the farther you look, it gets wider as you go. Um, but in landscape mode, in uh, you're, you're looking, again, it depends on the range. It, at 20 feet, you're probably looking at three to four foot of the water column. And that's, I'm doing some rough math in my head, so I could be off a little bit, but not, not much. 
And that's all manual adjustment. Yeah, so, and, and the units, so any of the Hummingbird units will, can automatically detect what orientation it's in. So if you twist it to down, let's say you take your transducer, you twist it to down mode, the unit's automatically going to change the screen for you and, and, and orient the screen in down mode or forward mode or landscape mode. Um, yeah, and that's all done manually on the transducer. You just pull it up, you twist it to whatever angle you want, wherever you want it, you flip it over to landscape mode, and, um, and it's all well, built in. Maybe sometime in the future that will be uh, done with uh, electronics, wouldn't it? So you you'd have to yeah so, so pot potentially but then we're adding every time we add that like you're adding well, complications costs um, yeah it's it's not that hard just to flip it around manually right now well, for what so, it costs I thought you'd already have that figured out yeah yeah, yeah sure <laughs> maybe 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 the 5.0 version yeah there you go. we'll tell the engineers so I'll I'll switch gears just briefly <laughs> not yeah, another battery. There's a, hey, I got I got a question. I don't know if you got the answer or not, but do you know if Lorentz has that that horizontal that landscape mode? I do. Yeah, they do. They yeah, do. yeah, they can run landscape. All all three. So so I, I use the analogy, and it and it works in a lot of cases. It's like Ford and Chevy and Dodge, right? Like every all of us, and I say all of us is in Garmin, Lorentz, and and Hummingbird. We all have things that we do well. We have advantages that that you know, over the competition. And there are things that, that even as Hummingbird, that we, we, sh we need to do better, right? There are things that Garmin does better than we do. Um, there are things that Lawrence does better than we do. And I think there are things that we do better than them. Um, just like you could argue, you know, your Chevy truck's better than the Ford truck because it's got more comfortable seats or it's got a better, uh, it gets better gas mileage, right? Like there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. They all make good product. Um, I don't but think you compare Ford to Chevy. <laughs> well, well, I yeah. use that analogy. And sometimes I get in trouble. It, it upsets some guys, but it's but it's the honest truth. Like in my opinion, there are things that we well, do really what well. Are, what are some of the things that Lawrence and, uh, and Garmin does better than, in your opinion? So, um, in this situation, if you look at so I'll talk about live. If you look at at live specifically, all of our live sonars, right? Garmin with Panoptics, um, Lawrence with uh, Active Target Two now, and then Hummingbird with Mega Live. I think on the live side of it. Our transducer has a quicker refresh rate, um, and like the the little short videos that I was showing there earlier, mm -hmm. that's the first version of software that we came out with. What we've done a really good job of is updating our software, and that's all free to the consumer. And I'll show you some screen captures here after this this portion. That's going to show is you that some trees. Seconds you're talking about, or minutes? I mean, what, how much faster? Is it? Well, you're talking refresh rates, right? It, it's yeah. it's it's in milliseconds. milliseconds. So so that transducer, so live sonar, in order to get. Let me, let me back up. Traditional sonar. Talk about 2D down imaging, side imaging. We send a sonar ping out of the transducer. Transducer, side imaging, transducer looks like that. Mm -hmm. We send a, a sonar ping out of the transducer. It travels through the water column. It bounces off whatever piece of structure or the bottom's there. And then it travels back up. And then we, we listen to that sonar signal come back. It's a send and receive system. That's like 2 day, 100 hertz. Yeah, so we use hertz, right? It doesn't matter if it's 455, 800, or... or Mega hertz, um, 1.2, um, and we listen in it, but it's a constant send and receive. And so when you look at side imaging on, on your fish finder or down imaging, whatever you see at the top of the screen in side imaging, that's what's happening right now. And then everything else is history, right? Everything else that's on that screen, I've went past, it's behind me, it's, it's history. With live sonar, it is constantly, it's what we call a phased array, and all that means is that there's a bunch of little arrays in there, in that little send, and it, they are all constantly sending out a sonar signal, and they're constantly receiving a sonar signal. So that's why we get that live, oh, that's why we get this live screen and everything is moving is because that transducer is constantly sending and receiving information, and we update the screen in milliseconds, right? About, it depends, but we'll say 30 to 60 times a second. We, we update and okay. refresh it. Right. Um, so that's one of the advantages of live. And again, doesn't matter if it's Garmin's, Lawrence's, or ours. We all kind of do the same thing. Um, and, it, and all of our technologies in general terms work the same. Okay. Yeah, the only reason I asked you about that was I've got a brother in all this. He's, he's strictly a Lawrence guy. And he told me, and, and I think actually what it amounts to is probably lack of training on his part. But he's a bank beater. He he's a does a lot of crankbait fishing shallow. And he's and he got this, and he just raced out and got it so he could say, "Hey, I got this." But uh, 
uh, he said they're abs his is absolutely worthless in shallow water. And I thought, well, man, you spend a lot of money for something that's absolutely worthless. Maybe you should have checked into it beforehand. But, but uh, it that, that's why I asked you that. So, if, so if, if they all had a feature where it, you could, yeah. Do it, that. So, so in in defense to that manufacturer's product, it's it is likely that it's not worthless in shallow water. It's more likely that whatever settings he's assigned to it is working better for him in deeper water than it is in shallow water, right? It, that is, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's probably more user error than it is. Well, yeah, I think it's because, lack of training. Uh, and, and it yeah. could be lack of training, lack of knowledge. Um, it, but the reality is, you know, as, as much as, like, I'd love to stand here and, and say, like, Ours is the only stuff anybody should ever put on their boat, which I do think that, right? Like, I do think we make the best products. But but in in fairness to our competitors, they're also making good products, okay? And so... I, you wouldn't sell it if you, if you didn't think it was the best, right? Yeah. No, I probably still would. I like money. Um, <laughs> you just need the money. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm going to be honest about that. He's got that. kids to put through college. Yeah, well, probably just one of the two. But, but yeah, like, that's expensive and... Um, but but no, I, I do I do I do feel like we have the best system. But but they are making good products, also, yeah. guys. Give credit where credit is due. Help this so what is it called on Lawrence? Uh, so Lawrence's is Lawrence's called Active Target. Like our, uh, so portrait. Uh, I think Lawrence calls it port. Oh okay. The, uh, the actual so model. we call it landscape, and, and and that's just our marketing term, right? Is it um, is Lawrence portrait mode? That portrait doesn't sound right. They all have a mode. We all have a down mode. We all have a forward mode. Okay. We all have a, a landscape. landscape. I want him to seem like a, you know, the brainchild there when he talks to his buddy. Right. Know, yeah. Did you know that this has landscape, Mark? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, no, it's okay. I Actually, if yeah. you don't mind, and I'll give you, a, if he comes back in here, I'll give you a 20. Just just tell him he's right. It's garbage. Tear it off there. We'll sell him some hummingbirds today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, tell him about yeah. our sale. Yeah, I'll say hummingbirds got that, man. You need to just go check right. it out. Yeah, well, you yeah. get it wrong. That's so, right yeah. <laughs> we got a question yeah. in the back. Yeah. Yes, sir. Each of those three positions, is that a snap in position? Or yes. Is it, are you adjusting it? So, it, it has a click adjustment in 10 degree increments. So, from straight down. To straight forward, it's 10 degrees every click, and it clicks in and locks into that position in 10 degree increments. And you can, not to get too deep in the weeds, but you can actually adjust the unit too to say, hey, um, I want to look at like 50 degrees, so I want to kind of focus it. So as it clicks around and adjusts, the unit will automatically change to that mode, and then you can actually tweak it a little bit more if you want to. But yes, it's it's automatically it clicks in. Same thing with the landscape. When you you're, there's a couple little silver buttons. Um, so you can barely probably see one right there, but there's a there's a little silver button on both sides of that mount, and you squeeze those in, and then you just fold the transducer out, and then it clicks in and locks into that landscape mode for you. So that's, that's the landscape, and that's also the angle up and down? Yeah, so, so in landscape mode, you can also, so that you can see this is kind of round. That's what twists. So you can adjust that landscape mode to point it down more if you wanted, or if you wanted to say you were in shallow water, and you were trying to shoot kind of level with the, with the surface of the water, you can rotate that transducer up more flat so it shoots a little flatter how, uh, how wide is that the, the beam on the live it's narrow so so again depending on the mode but let's just say we're in forward mode it's about 15 to 18 degrees right to left in front so you've got to be pretty well pointed at what your target is to be able to see it and again as the rain gets farther it, it starts to spread a little bit but it's narrow and it all of us are the same way or within a few you degrees know, we, we've got a gentleman in the back that's raised his hand two or three yeah. times oh you mean 360 or live uh, live live is is so it's any <clears throat> Gen 3 or Gen 4 Helix unit that has mega imaging built in. So mega down imaging or mega live image or mega side imaging built in. So from from let's say Helix 8 roughly up, Gen 3 or Gen 4, any Solix unit and any Apex unit. It's compatible with. In the Helix. In the Helix. Generation 3, what size screen? A 7G3N is not, G3N is not mega. It will not work with that unit. Yep. 
It has to have mega, mega down imaging or mega side imaging, that mega term. It has to be a mega unit. Your Helix 7 Gen 3 is only a side imaging unit or down imaging. It's not the mega. And the 7 mega is Gen 4. Gen 4. What's the, what, what is the difference between, I, I know that it's a mega, but I mean the non-mega and the mega, what, what was the Let me, difference? When I get, remind me when I get to the unit, okay. and I'll, I'll show you the difference between mega and, and not. Quality and what yep. Okay. So one of the unique things on Hummingbird, and not to, and I'll, I'll answer more questions. We're, we're about an hour in, and I got, like I said, time is not an issue. But I do want to talk about something that is unique to Hummingbird. So this is one thing that we have that the competition does not have, and it's called 360. Um, and again, I know it's probably hard to see back there in the back, but right here is kind of what is a, a, a 360 beam looks like. So if you've run side imaging or if you're familiar with side imaging, and this is where I, I wish I could use both my hands, but if you just imagine that the boat's floating up here on the roof and we're in, let's just call it 20 foot of water to make it easy, and my transducer's up there. Side imaging, again, is a, is a flat beam. So if the boat's gonna, it's gonna, the boat's gonna travel along this beam, the steel girder, we're coming behind us, and as we move through the water column, that side imaging beam just takes thin slices of the water column over and over and over. And as, it, as we move and it takes that thin slice, it builds up that image, and it does it to the right and it does it to the left. So one of the advantages of side imaging is we can orient stuff left and right on the screen. One of the disadvantages is the boat needs to be moving, because if I'm sitting perfectly still and the boat's sitting perfectly still, it's taking a thin slice of the same piece of structure over and over and over, and you just kind of get this blurry image on your screen, right? It's not pretty. You're not looking at anything. So you need to be moving in order to build that side imaging picture. With 360, we don't have to be moving. All 360 is doing is taking that side imaging beam, those, that left and right beam, from the transducer and we spin them in a circle and we that is the movement that we need to create the image it's the first forward looking sonar so we can take this screen capture here and again if you can see it you can see the two little flat beams and as we spin them in a circle we get the image that we want so there's a tree sticking up right here and you can see the shadow off that tree that's that's cast out here there's a little school of shad right here, right in front of the boat, right? I'll talk a little bit more about it, but this black ring that you're seeing, that's the water column. Um, and uh, so if you, again, if you imagine that the boat's up here and the, and the transducer and it's spinning in a circle, all we're doing is taking this water column that we're seeing and we're smushing it out flat on the bottom of the screen and making it here. And then this is the bottom of the lake and it would be directly underneath the transducer. So we could take that, if we could take out the water column and we could shrink this circle down, it would all shrink down and be right underneath the boat, right? So this is the bottom of the lake. As we look either forward, right, left, or behind us, whatever direction, but it allows us to see what's in front of us and cast to it or mark a waypoint without having to go over the top of it or go beside it and, uh, and do that. So it's the first forward-looking sonar. Um, and what 360 is really, really good at is eliminating dead water and finding structure. Um, because fish, I don't care if they're crappie or bass or walleye, they, uh, they orient to some type of structure, right? Whether it be treetops, whether it be ledges, whether it be boulders, rocks, gravel, doesn't matter. They're orienting to something at any time of the year. And so what 360 allows you to do is eliminate dead water really fast. Um, so with that, a couple screen captures showing some 360 stuff. I, talk, I think I told you earlier I'd show you some crappie on some beds. So... Oh, my laser pointer doesn't work on the TV. So you can see this is these are crappie beds, little pothole shadows. Um, so with 360, just like with side imaging, anything that's higher in the water column or that is harder is going to be white or, or a lighter shade, a, a brighter shade. Anything that's a softer bottom or that is deeper is going to be darker. So what you're seeing here, this is the, the actual pothole, and there's a little shadow because the sonar can't see what's in that hole, right? Just like if... If I'm standing here and Joe's standing here, we cast a shadow, you can't see what's, in, what's behind it. So it's, it's shading these potholes black on both sides. Um, and then there's some fish. There's a fish right there on one of them. Over here, there's some, uh, some actual habitat that they've sunk. I forget what lake this is on. Um, can anybody tell me on that right-hand screen, what, what shape are all those habitats? They're blocks. They're, 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 they're square like pallets, right? So if you look at the shadow, so the actual pallet is right here, and I apologize if it's hard to see, but you can see 
the square sides of it and the frame of it in each of the shadows. The shadow will tell you as much or more than what the actual return does. So you, yep. And then there's some crappie beds at the bottom. Do you ever have the the prop on the trolling motor interfere with anything? No. So the prop is is if it was and it's not showing up in any of these. If any if any time you'll see it, you might see a little white patch right here but it's again your prop so close to the transducer that you don't get any blur out um, the transducer looks right past it here's a here's a really good one of some crappie beds so and I, I know it's hard to see but there's little white dots in each one of these or not in each one but in some of them those are all crappie um, and this is another great one for um, he doesn't have the depth of water here but we're not but about in about two feet of water Right? The water column is tiny, and we're looking 50 foot. His range is at 50 feet. So with that transducer, I can see clear 50 foot in only about two or three foot of water. So this much water, I can see 50 foot out with that 360. It looks parallel to the surface. Why are we getting that black stuff on the right? So that On that left image. Yeah, so here and here, that's a weed bed, or that's the bank. So that's why it gets black behind it, because it's there's nothing there. Vertical shadow here. Yeah, yeah. That's trolling motor shaft. Yeah, you can get okay. you can get a shadow from the shaft of the trolling motor. Yep. If you won't see the prop, but you you can see the the shaft of the trolling motor. So uh, if you if you have suspended fish, do they give all like if they're higher up in the water column? Like right there. Yeah. Or are they so, going a shadow? I mean, how can you tell where they are depth wise? You couldn't have asked that question at a better time. If I had a five dollar bill, I'd give it to you. Well, I'll take a ten if you got one. So <laughs> I don't have my wallet. I left my wallet at home. Sorry. Um, so you, your question was perfect timing because what I'm getting ready to show you is some fish that are that are suspended up off the bottom, but not very far. So right here, and again, I apologize if it's hard to see, but each one of these little white. Speckles, I call them speckles, snowflakes, whatever, those are fish. See their shadows here and here and here, they're a little black. If a fish is laying right on the bottom, like catfish, we, we, we talked a lot to catfish and do a lot with them, right? Catfish always orients to the bottom. You'll see the fish and then the shadow will be attached to it right beside it, right? As those fish move up in the water column, those shadows will start to be detached from the actual fish. So these fish are not laying right on the bottom, but they're not very far because their shadows are pretty close to them. But as they get higher up in the water column, that shadow gets farther and farther away from them. Or likewise, if the fish are further out, that shadow gets further out. Yep. So, oh. But it still follows all the way up to the fish. Yeah. If it's a longer shadow, they're higher up. Yep. Okay. Yep. If the, if the shadow's farther away from the fish, so there's another fish right here. See that white speckle? Uh -huh. The shadow is right beside it. That fish is just almost laying right on the bottom. He's just laying right there. The really fun thing about catfish is they can be big enough that they they can and will sometimes on side image 360 make a very wonderful looking um, catfish shadow. Wow. And so yes, let like me. It's that that it's pretty neat because because they can be big and and you'll see it. So. That's a, he kind of hit on a, another kind of important topic there. So I get the, I get the question or, or I get the comment a lot of, hey, my buddy's got X brand. I don't care what it is. And he says he can tell if it's a crappie or a bass or a catfish and how big it is and all that. And that can absolutely be the case. But an important part of that, especially with side imaging, let's say, or, or down imaging is the way that that fish is oriented to the transducer. So again, let's imagine my boat's up here on this, uh, this steel girder and it's traveling along. I don't care what it is, if it's a, a, a bass, three pound bass, if he is pointed towards that transducer this way and as that transducer goes by, it's going to hit on his nose, it's going to kind of hit down his back and it's going to travel by and he's just going to look like a, a long sliver, right? Because it's, it's hitting him perpendicular and it's going to see his back, it's going to see his nose and you're just going to kind of see a uh, kind of a white blip. These fish here are perpendicular. They're laying like this or, or traveling sideways. And as that transducer goes by, it's hitting the back or the nose, whatever, and it's traveling along the side. And to Joe's point, if you see a catfish or something like that, if he's laying on the bottom of the lake and he's laying parallel to the way the transducer's going, as the transducer goes by him, it will see his tail, it'll see his neck, and then you'll see his, or his body, and then you'll see his nose. And you can say, hey, yeah, that's a catfish, right? It looks like it. The bass is the same way, a crappie's the same way. Um, 
So you, you can do it, and, and there's cases where you can tell the size, especially guys who are running live sonar and are run it day in, day out. They can see, hey, that crappie might be a pound and a half or a two pounder or a bass, whatever the species is, doesn't matter. Um, but a lot of that depends on how that fish is oriented towards the transducer to be able to get that kind of detail. Does that make sense? Seeing a nice crisp spoonbill is... Yeah, a spoonbill, right? Nice. Same, same deal. If you see yeah. a spoonbill and he's pointed towards you, you're going to see just a really long, thin sliver because you're shooting down his nose or his bill and then down his back and his body. But if he's per perpendicular and you go by him, you're going to see his tail. You're going to see that big, long snout come out in front. And you're going to be able to say, yeah, that's a spoonbill down there. All right. Um, we kind of hit on it earlier a little bit. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. This is another new, um, and this is something unique to Hummingbird and, and to Minn Kota, um, and it's called Target Lock. And what it does is, and it only works for Ultrex right now, but if you're running an Ultrex trolling motor, it allows you to mount this Target Lock accessory and the live transducer onto it, and it gives you independent steering from your trolling motor. And it gives you what we call Target Lock. So if I see a, a tree or something in the water with my live sonar, I can tap a button and it locks into that position. And no matter what my boat does, my boat drifts around, I turn circles, whatever, it will stay pointed at that piece of structure the whole time. And I can tell you that it absolutely works. Um, when we were at our national sales meeting last summer and we got to go out in the water with it, um, I found a piece of pole timber. We were on one of the boats, just a bass boat, in, uh, we were up in Minnesota. And there was just a, a, a literally just a blank tree piece of pole timber sticking up in the Mississippi River of, or in one of the little back sloughs. And I target locked onto it and I took the boat and I went in a 360 degree circle about 40 feet from it all the way around and I kept that target in, this, in the screen the whole time. Um, so the way it works without getting into a whole lot of detail but basically on top of this um, um, shaft that we've got here is a GPS heading sensor so it knows what, where it is and it knows what direction it's pointed. So when we hit the target lock button, it locks into that heading and it even has got a little yellow arrow on there that shows you what direction it's pointed and then it runs independent. So no matter if my trolling motor is in spot lock or if I'm running it on my foot pedal and, and manually fishing, it's going to stay pointed at that direction no matter what we do. Um, so, so to back that up a little bit, because I, I, I do, oh you've got this light, great. So to, to talk a little bit more about target lock, so one of the disadvantages to um, mounting Mega Live, mounting a, a forward-looking live sonar to your trolling motor is one of the number one features that people look for. One of the number one features that people look for with Minn Kota motors is spot lock, right? Um, and so, as Troy's mentioned before, if, if we have this transducer mounted on the trolling motor shaft, potentially if we're trying to hold a position, right, or, or if we're trying to use one of the features like follow the contour on our one boat network, that's where basically your hummingbird steers you around map lines, okay, potentially you could be fighting your trolling motor, okay, and so one of the things Target Lock will do is it will afford you the ability to point that transducer completely independently of whatever your trolling motor is doing, okay? Now, the flip side to that, if it was completely separate, people say, well, wait a minute, Joe, wait a minute, Troy. I've been running this thing on my, on my motor for the last year. I really, I really want to be able to still point it wherever my motor points. What about that? Well, guess what? We also have a mode where you can sync it and you can have it essentially mirror whatever your motor's doing. So we can do we can do three really great things here. We can do the target lock where we lock onto something and can go around it and still look at that. We can do it where they will operate independently of one another or we can do it where they operate in conjunction with one another. So um, that is something that is exclusive to Hum and Bird and the One Boat Network. Question in the back. So you're saying you put it on, connect them together, you put it on spot lock, but your head's turned so that that is correct yes you can have it lock onto a target while you're in spot lock um, you can you can have it steer any which way you want to when you're in spot lock right so if you've ever been on if you've ever been on a boat with spot lock um, that that the head of the motor that points you that steers you that holds a position it doesn't normally stay in one spot. It kind of has to make micro adjustments move around a little bit. And so potentially, 
if you're trying to spot lock and you're trying to mega live at the same time, you could be fighting that system, right? And so target lock is the only solution on the market right now to do what this is doing. Um, and, and again, this is part of the one boat network, right? The way that we're able to do this is we've got our hummingbirds and our Minn Kotas and everything working in conjunction together. I wonder if you're not using your trolling motor at all. You're just running big motor. That's if you're just running it. the big motor? Yeah. You I can mean, I don't, I'm going to be able to zero in on certain things or spot lock without the trolling motor. Yeah, you can... You can you, so, can, you can do it that way. I mean, yeah. obviously the trolling motor's got to be in the water be in because the, water, the live's right? connected to the trolling motor, so you couldn't be up on plane running. I want it completely separate. Yeah. I don't want the trolling motor and, in the water. And so we do, we do make... That's why I was looking so the hand control would be yeah, your we do make. Yeah, we do make that hand control. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. So... Because you could run the boat and manual pole. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've seen a lot of consumers get very creative with how they rig up their mega live. There are, there are some, bless you, there are some companies who have come up with um, some third party solutions, right, that are, that are pretty innovative that will give you options outside of just that. But, but as far as actually doing what we do where you can make it mirror, you can make it do separate, or you can target lock, it's the only solution on the market doing that right now. And there's actually one other mode too, what we call sweep. So there's um, mega live sweep which so let's say you're fishing along and not necessarily pointing at any particular piece of structure but you just want it to look so I can turn on the sweep feature and what it does is basically from the nose of the boat the live will sweep back and forth 60 degrees either side so 120 total degrees and it just sets there and windshield wipers back and forth so as I'm fishing along a bank or doing whatever and I'm just kind of fishing to see that live is constantly sweeping back and forth and then you glance down at your screen and you see oh there's a brush pile you can hit the target lock button, it locks into that position, and then you can go over and, and pick it apart, see if there's fish on it, whatever. So, yeah, you've got you've got target lock, you've got Minkota steer, which is when it mirrors what the motor's doing, um, and then the sweep feature. Um, so, this is just a, a couple quick, this is kind of the way the, the, the interface works, and I'll show you a, a screen capture with it. But down here at the bottom, if you're on one of our touchscreen units, a Solex or an Apex unit, you'll have these menu options down here at the, butt, at the bottom to tell it what, to, what you want it to do. So, it's got target lock, sweep, Minkota steer, which is what we're in. So, right now, the, the target lock is following the trolling motor. Um, back to the home button, so that points it back to the, to the nose of the boat or the, the, the direction the boat's pointed. And then you've got a left and right steer option. Um, also, when you're in rough water, too, it makes sure you're really close to the running right trolling motor. Yeah. You know, when you're in and out of the water, you're, you know, when you've got a deep V set up, yeah. you don't want to fix trolling motor. Yeah. So a couple more just quick screen captures. This is off some newer software. So those, those little short videos that I showed you earlier were off of a, an early version of software. We've done some updates and, um, to it to, to update the software to help the resolution to get a little better target separation so we can see fish and trees and all that a little different. So these are some, some screen captures that another one of our coworkers has, uh, took and, and sent to us. So what you're looking at here, this is a bridge piling. And we're looking right at that bridge piling. So that's why you don't see anything behind it. Um, but there's fish hanging out right here, right off that bridge piling. The bridge piling comes down, and then it's kind of got a little set where the, you know, it's getting bigger as it goes down deeper, and then it goes down to the bottom of the lake. Um, we're in forward mode in this one. Another one, and this is where I, you asked the question about, hey, how far away is that? I can't tell you know, that fish or whatever it is. So in this one, we've got the grid, what we call the grid on. So the grid tells us our transducer is right here at zero feet. So this is 10, 20, 30 feet out to 70, 80 feet as we look forward. And then we've got it manually set to depth as well. Um, and we're looking 70 foot. This line is 70 foot. So now if I did see a fish, I could tell you for sure this fish is 30 foot away from us. And he's, uh, what, in about 28 foot deep is where those fish are. So with that grid on, instead of kind of guessing, hey, he's about 30 feet or whatever, I can tell you exactly how far those fish or that tree is away from us um, based off of it. And that's an option you can turn on and off in the units if you want to. Is there an option to show radius rings instead of the grid? So there's an option in like 360 to turn radius rings on and some stuff like that. Um, again, it's the same type of deal. So from wherever the, the boat is or the transducer is, it puts a range. It, it does it in... A quarter that so the total range you're looking. Let's say we're looking 80 feet total. It's going to put a range ring every quarter. So at 20 feet, 
and then at halfway at 40 feet, at three quarters of the distance, 60 feet, and then the outside ring will be at 80. So you have the ability to put rings on like 360. You don't on live because the reality is we're not looking in a circle for a ring, we're looking directionally. So we put a, a range, a distance, and a depth on there. Um, same thing here, this is just a different color option, so we don't have to just run a kind of our standard black background or white background. Um, you've got all the color options in here. I, like, I kind of like running this blue screen. I run this blue screen more, um, especially even with my 2D sonar some, but sometimes the, the blue screen, it, it just helps little things pop out that are in trees or whatever, it makes them a little brighter. And this is completely a personal preference. There is no, what screen should I use in the daytime? What screen should I run at night? What color should I run? It's, it's simply a personal preference. Everybody's eyes are a little different. We all see different colors a little different. So whatever color works background for you, or if you're looking at side imaging, whatever color is side imaging or down imaging, whatever the color works for you, that's the color to use, whatever one you can see the How best. How does that work with polarized sunglasses? So um, any of the screens with polarized glasses, if you're looking directly on, so you won't notice it at all. What happens is if you, if you tilt your head or you tilt the screen, you'll see it kind of go black, and that's the, that's the actual polarization in the lens, right? Mm -hmm. That's the... I think they call it like the mini blinds or whatever. That's what keeps the reflection off. And so it doesn't, if you're looking head on at a screen, it won't go away. And it, a lot of that depends on the quality of the glasses too, the polarization. But if you get, get your head, you'll see it'll, it'll get black, um, it'll get dark. Yeah, that's one of my issues. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with the screen. It's more to do with the, what the lenses do. They're, they're designed to get rid of reflection. Okay, I, so the, I can't see the gas pump with my polarized glasses on. Yeah, if you look so, at the screen, yeah. you know, the, the little dollar readout, you won't be able to see it. A yeah, lot of that picture you just had on there. This one? Okay, so that's, okay, if I'm looking up my graph, that's what I'm looking at right there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then if I'm standing up there on the bow and get ready to fire a cast out there at that tree, let's say, mm -hmm. that's out what? Uh, between, 25 feet? Between 20 and 30 feet, okay, mm -hmm. and then... And then what is it down? So it's 30 feet to right here. Okay. So we're, we're in about 55 feet of water or so. Okay. So well, I can tell you. Of it, what, you're 25 feet that way too? Yeah, so we're about 25 feet away okay. and we're about, depending on exactly where okay. you want to cast into that tree, but we're about 30 foot down roughly. Okay, so that's how you judge all that. Huh? Yep. And so, you know, what you do is you'd have to cast out generally out and, you know, past it, let your bait sink down and then you bring it back either through the top or through the side, wherever you were wanting to cast to. Yeah. But that's what's telling you where that tree is, how far away and how deep in the water column it is. Here's another one. Um, same tree, but now you see there's actually some, some ball of shad or something back here behind that tree. This is the same tree we're looking at, a little different angle. Um, and then again, as the boat moves around, you kind of see, oh, all right, there's some, there's some shad hanging out back there. Hmm. And that's all I've got for the PowerPoint part. And we're, we're about an hour and 10 or 15 minutes in. Um, is everybody good? Do we need to take a, a quick five minute break or do you, you, everybody good? So what I'll do now is, um, I'm going to switch over and... We've done a really good job of being very interactive, which is much easier for me and, and much more beneficial. Um, so I've got the unit running over here at the side. Um, generally, kind of the second half of the, of the presentation, what I generally do is, because I, I, I get the question a lot with side imaging or with down imaging or with live or 360 is, my screen doesn't look like what you showed, right? Those screen captures I was just showing you, I can't see that, or I can't see it in side imaging. And so generally what I kind of do is give people kind of some tips and tricks as to what the settings that I run in, in certain scenarios are in side and down imaging, um, 360, whatever you want to do. If there's a specific question like how do you mark a waypoint or how do I delete my track, whatever that is, I can answer those questions as well. What's the app that you get on your Android to use to update the software? It's called the One Boat Network app. And it's um, one boat network, and it's available on either um, Apple, iOS, iOS or Android. Or Android. Um, and I can show it to you, and I don't know if Joe's got it on his phone, but if you want to, I can show you the app, and we can make sure you get it downloaded. And then the only thing you got to do is just Bluetooth it to your Hummingbird unit the first time, and that way it gets all the information. I did mention also it will back up your waypoints as well on the app, so you have your, apps, your waypoints on there. Okay. Um, Any other questions or anything on that part? Is everybody familiar with side imaging? I'll talk about side imaging a little bit because that still is our most popular 
type of sonar and it's, and, and it's what most guys are running and use. So if you're familiar with it, briefly I'll talk, I guess my, my laser pointer doesn't work anyways. So what we're looking at here is this is the, this is the path of the boat. Again, if you, we use the same analogy, we're, we're traveling this steel girder in the water column. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a 3D image of what's in the water and what the bottom of the lake looks like to the right and to the left. And right now our range is set to 60 foot. Um, our range is set to 60 feet. So, and we're in 42 feet of water. So from right here out to the edge is the 42 feet, 38 feet of water, right? And then from here on out is whatever that extra distance is. With side imaging, it's always going to delete or it's gonna take out the depth of water. So if we were in 60 feet of water right now, all we would see would be the water column all the way out to the edge of the screen. We wouldn't see the bottom of the lake at all. So whatever depth of range or whatever depth of water you're in, it's always gonna subtract that from the total distance it's looking. My kind of general rule of thumb or what I tell people to start with, I like to run my range about four times my average depth of water. So if I'm, gonna, if I'm averaging between 15 and 20 feet of water, my boat's setting in 15 to 20 foot of water, my range is somewhere around 80 feet generally. That makes about a quarter of the screen on either side of, your, of, of the boat, the water column, and it makes about three quarters of the screen the bottom of the lake. So I get good coverage of the bottom of the lake to see what's down there if there's structure, but I can still see the water column well enough to see, hey, there's a tree sticking up or there's a ball of shad or whatever's in the water column. Um, so again, kind of roughly about four times my average depth of water um, is where I generally run my range. So like right now, we're, we're not near that, right? We're in 45 feet of water. We're only looking 60 feet total. Um, another important one, to get a good kind of clear image. And in the apex or the Solix units, I can touch the top left-hand side up there where it says sonar and it will bring up this quick option. If I'm running a helix unit, I hit the menu button one time. When I hit the menu button one time, it brings up what we call our express menu. And what I'll talk about is chart speed. Right there. So what chart speed is, is how fast this screen scrolls from top to bottom. Or how long you want your fish. And, and, or how long, yeah, how long you want your fish. So here's the, here's the thing to think about is if my chart speed scrolled up real fast and I'm running at 10 because as, as a man, if we see anything and we see a range from zero to 10, if five is good, 10 is better, right? Like that's just human nature. We turn everything up as I want as much as I can get out of it, right? So I turn, I turn my chart speed up to 10. That screen starts to scroll really fast. And let's say this boat, you know, we're in our boat and we're fishing and the boat's going along at two mile an hour. We're on our big engine. We're just idling along, looking to do a cove to see what's there. And we go by this rack of turkey vests that's sunk in the water, right? It's uh, four foot in diameter. As the boat travels this steel girder and it goes by that rack of turkey vests, what's it going to do to those racks if my screen's scrolling really fast and my boat's going really slow? What's it going to do to them, you think? It's going to stretch it out and, and it's going to distort it, right? Because the, the screen is scrolling fast and the boat's going slow, so it's going to stretch that image out. So instead of getting a nice round rack of turkey vests, we're going to get this long, oblong, you know, distorted uh, image of something we can't tell what it is. And on the flip side of that, if I turn my chart speed all the way down to one, and you'll see now it's refreshing really slow and it's going slow, and let's say we're idling along at four, five, six mile an hour, and we go by that same rack of turkey vests, what's it gonna do? If I'm going fast and the screen's going really slow, it's not gonna have time. It's gonna condense that, that, gonna that rack action. of tree, or if it was a stump, or if it was a, uh, a stake bed crappie fishing, if it was a stake bed, whatever, it's either not gonna put it up on the screen because it doesn't have time, because the boat's going so fast, but by the time we get past that, the screen doesn't have time to refresh and actually put it on there. So what I, what I kind of tell people, and this is, this is everything that I'm telling you is, is kind of where I tell people to start, and you can make fine adjustments from there, but I want my chart speed number here to just about match my boat's miles per hour or maybe one digit higher. So if I'm going two and a half, three miles an hour, and I'm just idling with my big engine, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm searching this, this new lake or somewhere I haven't been, and I'm just trying to find if there's structure, if there's something there worth fishing, 
I want my chart speed to be the same as my boat's miles per hour or maybe one digit higher. Um, that for me and for most guys will get you the best image. It gets you, it matches up. Uh, and you can tweak that a little bit. Every boat's a little bit different, but there's really never a scenario where your boat's going two or three mile an hour and your chart speed is at 10. It just doesn't work. You just won't get that clear, pretty image. Um, at with, any point, is there a chance that the GPS speed can kind of sync up with your chart speed? So good question. We get it a lot. And there's not. Um, and he, and th there's not really a scenario where we match them up. And here's the reason why. Let's say we go to 2D sonar. We go to old traditional 2D sonar. In 2D sonar, I, if I'm ever using it, and we do use it like on Table Rock Lake in the wintertime, our bass get out and they suspend under schools of shad and we use 2D sonar. I use 360 to find those schools of shad and the fish are underneath of them. I want my chart speed running as fast as it can, no matter if the boat's moving or not. Because a lot of times I'm, I'm setting pretty much still or I'm not traveling much and I'm using 360 and, and 2D sonar to find those fish, but in that case, I want my chart speed to roll as fast as I can, and all three of them, so let's say I go, oh, I guess my TV's not touch screen, is it? So let's say I'm running a screen like this where I've got all my sonars running at the same time. We have to match up all three chart speeds, right? So if I change my chart speed on side imaging, it's automatically going to change my chart speed on the other two, um, and there's, there's not an ability to run those independent. So we don't do it where we match up with the GPS speed of the boat and the, and the chart speed because there's just a lot of scenarios where you don't want that to happen. There's times where you want 2D running as fast as it can, and it's automatically going to speed up the other two in correlation. Well, even if not matched up, you know, just like the auto volume in your truck you drive. Yeah, right. You know, if, if there's like 30% increase over and the amount of speed change, you know. Another, another thing, I mean, we, we, we probably could, but there are, some, there are some scenarios. And even, like I said, I told you, you know, in my boat, I run it one digit higher or the same miles per hour. I know some guys that run it two digits higher or maybe three or maybe one or two slower to get the best image because – you know, the way the transducer is mounted, the way the units run in the boat, it, it all kind of plays into that. And that's why I say it's kind of a rule of thumb, like it's it's a starting point. But feel free to make an adjustments from what I tell you. But in generally terms, it's it's minor adjustments. You're not going to make major adjustments to that. Um, to that. Um, so the advantage of side imaging, um, getting back to it a little bit, is obviously I can orient stuff right and left on the screen. I can also mark waypoints right and left. And so... So this is an old blown up bridge. So this here and this here was an old bridge. Um, I'm gonna stop the, the screen from moving here for just a second. Um, and if I wanted to mark a waypoint, I could move my cursor over or I could use my finger, touch a spot. It's gonna, hey, do you wanna, what do you wanna do? I wanna mark a waypoint. So now I've dropped a waypoint here. If I wanted to come back and fish that waypoint, um, I can go to my chart screen. You can see it's waypoint 18. Um, so if I go to my chart screen now, and zoom in, is that waypoint 18? It is waypoint 18. So you can see this was the path of the boat. That waypoint's <laughs> off to my right. I can orient stuff right and left on the screen and, and mark a waypoint and go fish that exact spot. Um, one of the disadvantages to side imaging is it's a little harder to interpret, right? It's a little harder to picture if you're not used to seeing it because we take that water column, we lay it in the middle, but in reality, the way the bottom of the lake is, is this point here, Stop the screen one more time. This point here and this point here would be touching underneath the lake, right? Those Left two, right, foot. right? We're just we're taking uh, right underneath the bottom, right underneath the boat. We're taking the lake if it was laid out flat. We're splitting it apart, and we're taking the water column that's in the middle, and we're laying it out underneath. So, and that's kind of the confusing point. But anywhere on this side and anywhere on this side those two points are actually together underneath the boat. But we have to split it apart in order to get that 3D image of the water column and the bottom of the lake and lay it out flat. So we take the lake and we split it apart and we take the water column and we just take it and we lay it out flat in the middle. So the same thing that you see, this is not a terrible example, but here's a ball of shad. And here you can see kind of some speckles. This is the same ball of shad. But the boats traveled right over the top of them and both the, the left hand and the right hand beam as it's scanned down underneath the boat have picked up that ball of shad. Now obviously they're off to the right a little bit more than they are to the left, but there's a few over here, there's a few over here. But when that ball of shad is laying here in the middle of the water column, 
and we split it apart, we split that ball of shad in two and we lay it out on both sides. Does that make sense? You'll see it with trees. If you travel right, if there's a treetop sticking up or a tree sticking up on the bottom of the lake and you go right over the top of it, you'll see that tree sticking out over here with the, with the top of it like this. And you'll see the same thing on, on the left-hand side. You'll see a tree sticking up with the, with the top of it like that. And you'll see kind of a mirror image. It's the same tree. We've just split it in two because we've drove right over the top of it. And that's kind of the only way we can put it up on the screen. Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to kind of start wrapping things up here. I'll talk about down imaging real quick. Um, and I'll talk about some of the advantages. One of the advantages and one of the disadvantages of down imaging. One of the advantages... It's easy to interpret. Like this is the, the, you know, so again, down imaging, let me back up just a second. Down imaging is similar to side imaging. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a thin beam forward to back and it's about a 45 degree angle underneath the boat. So if the transducer is where I'm at, it's like this, but it's, it's really thin front to back. And the same, same rule applies as the boat moves through the water column. We take thin slices underneath the boat. And as we take those thin slices, we build them up to build this 3D image. So it's easy to see, hey, there's a, there's a hump right here. And there's, this is that same bridge, blown up bridge that we saw earlier. There's some riprap um, uh, concrete on top of it. Um, and it's right underneath of it. One of the disadvantages to down imaging is we can't orient stuff right and left on the screen anymore. So I don't have it in this presentation, but I used to use a screen capture that, that another one of our guys did. He was in 120 feet of water. So it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I'm in 20 feet of water, that beam is about 20 feet wide at the bottom. If I'm in 40 feet of water, it's about 40 feet wide. This guy was in 120 feet of water with down, with, with down imaging, and he had went over a bunch of trees that were sticking up off the bottom. And the unit, because this is the way it works, it lined all those trees up on the bottom of the lake, right? And it was flat. So you see all these trees sticking up right off the bottom in a, in a perfect straight line. Trees don't grow in a straight line. I don't care if they're on the bottom of the lake or anywhere else, right? So one of the disadvantages to down imaging, or one of the things you just got to know and kind of think about is, and this is an extreme example, but when I was in 100, or when he was in 120 feet of water, and he saw all these trees that were underneath of him, in down imaging, we take all those trees and we line them up into a straight row. So if you would have marked a waypoint with down imaging, and now I can show you here, if I, it doesn't matter where I touch. If I touch the top of this rock pile and I mark a waypoint, waypoint 19, close. If I go back to that chart screen, you'll see <coughs> waypoint 19. will be right in line with the, tra with the path of the boat. So you, I just showed you inside imaging. I moved the cursor over and I touched a spot and it marked that waypoint over to the right where it was. In down imaging, every time I mark a waypoint, it will mark that waypoint directly underneath the boat. So when he was in 120 foot of water and he saw some fish in the top of one of these trees and he marked it as a waypoint, that tree could have been up to 60 feet to his right and left or left, right? Because in 120 feet of water, that beam is 120 feet right, wide, rough math. 60 feet to my right, 60 feet to my left. If that tree was 40 foot off to my left, but we had to put it in a straight line, the waypoint's going to be there, but the tree is actually over here. Does that make sense? Now, that's an extreme example, right? If you're in 20 feet of water and you mark a waypoint and down imaging, the beam's only 10 feet wide on either side. And even if you mark the waypoint and you pull up, even if you're not right on top of it, it's really close to you. You're going to be able to find it and make an adjustment. So I don't want to over-exaggerate the point, but just something to kind of know in down imaging, if you mark a waypoint, it's always going to put that waypoint in the path line or the line of the boat path. With side imaging, you're able to move that cursor right and left and mark a waypoint where the actual piece of structure is or, or whatever it is you're looking for. <clears throat> any other questions? We're at an hour and a half, and I don't want to take up any more time. I'll be happy to stand here and answer more questions, show you more stuff on the, on the units. But, uh, I mean, I, we've, we've well went over our time, and I could stand up here all day. So um, with that, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So if you look down into the <coughs> side of the thing, your down image might show one, like I said, the narrow line under the boat, but you could go over and mark in a waypoint and not do the whole thing. I'm still working off 
1996 technology long ago. So can you go down and then take a point on the side screen structure and find your waypoint there and have it accurately show up? Yeah, so if I'm in... So this is where it's going to kind of depend on what unit you're running and, and, and some of that. But with, with any... Um, that's the thing, that's, the, that's part of my being here, is that I'm wanting to invest and look at getting something like this, but I'm trying to... There's, there's an overload. Yeah, of, of, right. There's a lot of stuff to try to figure out. You have a seminar that just tells me what the hell I'm looking at most of the time when I'm looking at the different things. I was out last September uh, up in Minnesota for a walleye thing. The first time I've been out in the blue, it's been a great time. Uh, one of the guys is running brand new technologies that the folks had technology. And what it takes is really interesting to see how you're marking the waypoints and go and what what the technology is allowing you to do at this point. But like I said, there's a lot to take in. It's yeah. So you you anytime you mark a waypoint, the only the only technologies that allow you to mark it directionally would be side imaging or 360. Because 360 is basically is taking side imaging and spinning it in a circle. And when we do that, we have the ability on the screen. Because any of the sonar, we're taking a 3D representation, right? Even with, with down imaging, we're looking at the water column, we're looking at the bottom of the lake, and we're laying that out flat on a 2D screen. So we lose one dimension no matter what we do. And so with down imaging, I talked about it. With side imaging, yeah, you absolutely can. So even if I have all four screens pulled up here like I do on, on this Apex unit, if I have the side imaging screen down there is the one that is currently kind of active. It's got, a, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a little yellow frame around it. I can take and mark, and I can mark a waypoint on that screen and, and it be accurate, right, to where my finger touched right there. But the same rules apply if I'm in down imaging or 2D sonar or whatever. Um, and one of the advantages, that, but with our touch screen units, I can take two fingers and touch them, and I can bring down imaging up into full screen. I can look at it and say, hey, that's something I want to fish or not. And then when I get done, I just touch my screen with two fingers, and it puts it away, and it brings back my four-pane view. Um, but the only sonar that you can mark a waypoint directionally with is side imaging or 360. Both 2D sonar and down imaging are going to mark that waypoint directly underneath the boat. Because we lose that ability with those sonars to, to orient stuff right and left. You're like you're always going to lose one dimension. It's just the physics of it. Without you running strictly down imaging, it's probably pretty slim to none. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it really does compress it. Just say, you know, he's used that beam as the example where you're doing like a 45 degree sweep all the way through. It's just compressing it all into that one flat. Yeah. 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 Is it beneficial in that sense of while you're you got down imaging and you've got the side imaging, but then you've got actually one of the guys last year was running, you know, he had a, I don't know what version his was, but then he was running a live, a live sonar independent. Mm -hmm. So, so kind of, there, it doesn't matter what sonar we're talking about, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. So, I, I'll kind of briefly. Advantages of down imaging, it's easy to orient, it's easy to picture what's on the screen and see what it is and say, hey, that's a tree or that's a rock pile, right? We know what the disadvantage is. Side imaging, we can look left and right, we can orient stuff left and right on the screen. A little harder to interpret sometimes and, and understand exactly what you're looking at. Um, 360 is nice because I can look all the way around anywhere in a circle. Um, one of the disadvantages to 360, and I didn't get into it because it becomes a little bit more complicated, but we lose that vertical aspect with 360. So say the transducer was, or the 360 is where that fire light alarm is right there. If it marks fish in the water column 20 feet away from you, it's going to be kind of hard maybe to visualize. If it was 20 feet away, we can't tell you if those fish are at the surface 20 feet away or if they're directly underneath the boat 20 feet away. We lose this, that range. We can tell you they're 20 feet away from the boat, but we don't know where in the water column 20 feet away from the boat those fish are. That's why we look at the shadow. When you mentioned the radius ring, when I wanted yeah. to question earlier, that, tell, that would be it exactly. So you cast out 25 feet. Well, you're going to hit that damn thing one way or another. Right. It's, it's, imagine if you had a sinking bait, right, and you cast it 25 feet, and that, that bait is going gonna, is gonna to sink in an arc. 
you know, around that 25 foot till it gets completely underneath you. It's the same thing with 360 when we see fish. We can't tell you where they're at in the water column without some other additional, um, you know, looking at the shadow or something else because we lose that ability to, to place them in the water column where they're at. They're somewhere 20 feet away from you, but we don't know if they're at the surface of the water or they're directly underneath the boat. Um, one of the disadvantages to live, any type of live, is it just doesn't have wide coverage area, right? We're, we were talking about earlier, it's a narrow beam, you know, generally right to left, it's a narrow beam, and you gotta be pretty well pointed right at what you're wanting to look at or within reason to be able to see it, and you gotta be able to cast to that pretty narrow slice of the water column as well to be able to, to see your bait. So in that sense, when you're using, and have something like a light mount, you had it mounted in the front of your trolling motor, as your trolling motor, take it over, it's just kind of scanning that 15. Yep. You have and that's why a lot of guys run like a handheld or target lock where you can steer it independent. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's why, I mean, obviously I'm a sales rep and I, and I get to run this, but like if you can run 360, so I get the question a lot too, like if you, if I, they ask me, if you could run 360 or live, which one would you run? You can only one run, only run one. I would run 360 over live because if I can find structure, I can find fish. Like if they're there, I, I can see them. I'll use side imaging. I'll use 360. I can see if there's fish there. I, got, I still got to make them eat, right? One of the most frustrating things about live is when you know there's fish there and you see them and they won't eat. Like you want to get really mad fishing. You've done it. If anybody, if you've run live for any amount of time, and it don't matter if it's us or the competition, but you see that there's fish there hanging out and you've cast every color of bait, every size that you've got in the boat, and they just sit there and smile at you. Right. Like that's, that's one of the most frustrating things you deal with. So hey, did you have anything there that where you could compare the mega 360 to the non mega? Oh, yeah, so you want 360 in it? I can show you. Yeah, I just wanted to see what the difference was. Now, the, the, the non-mega, is that what come out with the, like, the, the 1100 series? Like, I got 1199 Humming Brothers on my, my boat. Is that, is that the, the, uh, the non-mega, is that what come out for that series of graphs? No, yeah, so those units would have all been non-mega. Yeah. Um, mega Imaging came out with Gen 3. Gen 3. Sorry, I, I've, I've made an adjustment I didn't want to make. I want to go to 360. All right. So his question was, can you show me the difference in Mega and, like, the other frequency ranges? So Mega, it's, it's running in Mega right now. Um, and if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, it's, it's not super important, but it's telling you that it's running between 1.05 and 1. What, 175 megahertz. So we're pinging that range. Um, and every frequency gives us a little different return. So not to get too deep in the weeds, but if you think about chirp or what chirp actually is, and it, chirp became pretty popular about four or five, six years ago. Um, but if you imagine a piano keyboard laid out here, um, with traditional sonar, we ping basically one key over and over and over, right? It could be 455 kilohertz, it could be 83, it could be whatever. What chirp basically does is we ping a range of frequencies. And that's what it's telling you down there. And it's like taking your finger and running it back and forth on a section of that keyboard. And every frequency, every key that we hit gives us a little different return. And so what the unit then does is says, okay, I'm pinging this range of frequencies and I'm picking out the best returns that I, that I get and then I'm displaying them up here on the screen. So that is what chirp is. And we can chirp in any of these frequencies, but Mega itself at, at about 1.1, 1.2 megahertz is really good at giving us good resolution so we can see good detail and it gives us good range. When we came out with Mega Plus, the plus just meant extended range. We could, we could look farther. So one of, the, one of the original kind of limitations of Mega was that it was only good to about 100, 125 feet really that you could kind of see. And once you got past that range, it got pretty dark and, and it couldn't pull it out. With plus, we can look to 150 foot if we want to or longer and still get that good resolution. Um, the original frequency that we used, and you'll notice when I touch on this, oh, you know what, we didn't record it in the simulator. Well, it should have. The simulator that it's running in right now, we didn't record 455, so it didn't change. But what you would see if we were on the water and I changed to the 455 kilohertz, you'll see down here, now it's pinging between 420 and 520 kilohertz. It would have got a little bit darker, 
the, the advantage to 455 is that it gets really good range. I can see a long range, a long ways with 455. Maybe lose a little bit of the, the resolution, but if I'm, um, let's say on Table Rock, um, so at the Kimberling City Bridge, underneath the Kimberling City Bridge, and just to the kind of northeast is the old White River Bridge from the old White River. It's still there, it's still up, it's, but it's in like 180 to 200 foot of water depending on the lake level. If I wanted to go out and I want to image it, which is what we used to do with side imaging to get those kind of cool pictures that we showed in, in presentations, I would go in 455 because I could see through that water column 200 feet, still see that bridge down there setting after 60 years, probably more than that now, of being in the water. So. For 90% of people, 90% of the time, mega is the best frequency to use. It works good in shallow water. It works good in deeper water, out to about 150 feet. Um, if there's a scenario where you really want to see a long, long ways away from the boat, then 455 might work for you because that frequency penetrates water a little and penetrates distance a little better. But for most people, mega is the best. And I run it 95, 98% of the time I run mega. It's just, it's that good. But you can switch, and, and on the on the Apex or Solix units, you click up here at the top to do it. And when I click up there, you'll see it'll give me the different frequency ranges. If you're running a Helix unit, you just hit the little check mark button. So there's a little check mark button. If you press it, it will automatically change the frequency for you. All right. Any other questions? If you do, if you got it, you want to, you can come up. You're welcome to touch the unit, press buttons, do anything you want, ask me questions. Joe's talking to somebody. Ask him questions. We'll be happy to answer them. I certainly appreciate it. We've, we've talked for almost two hours. So thank you guys very much.